And good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Ryan Burroughs, Executive Director of the American Kratom Association. We're joined this evening by Mac Haddo, Senior Fellow on Public Policy. We call this meeting tonight to give you a complete state and federal update, as well as details around our town hall scheduled for next week at the Champs Trade Show in Las Vegas, plus much more to keep you in the know as we are quickly moving through 2024. The Q&A is open throughout the webinar, so please be sure to get your questions in. And with that, I will now turn it over to Mac. Uh, thank you, Ryan, and thanks for everyone joining us. Uh, I'll start with uh, with something for those of you that were uh, available to watch the hearing that took place today in the state of Georgia on the proposed Creighton Consumer Protection Act. Uh, it was a, a very interesting exercise in the way that legislation gets developed and and deliberated on and passed. Uh, we spent a, a hours and hours prior to that hearing working with various members of the committee in order to secure what we think were very important amendments that would protect the accessibility of Kratom and pure unadulterated Kratom in the marketplace for the citizens of Georgia. Uh, the trial attorneys and their, uh, and their uh, I was about to call them something I shouldn't have, the, the, the representative who has been their uh, spokesperson uh, have been fighting against us along the way. And what this essentially has been up until now is a trial attorney's bill, not a Kratom Consumer Protection Act. And there was in fact one provision that they were fighting hard over the past couple of weeks to retain, which would have allowed for any individual who felt like they had been harmed by Kratom to sue everyone in the distribution chain from the processor, the distributor uh, to the retailer. And they had specific language that would allow for damage, the certain levels of damage to be accrued in civil courts. This is the, the trial attorney's dream because it allows for everyone in that supply chain to be literally criminalized in a court of law. I'm sorry, not in a civil litigation to be subject to tremendous fines and, and penalties for being there. And obviously, uh, it, it would enhance the number of defendants that the trial attorneys could then bring to court, and it had nothing to do with delivering Kratom, safe and unadulterated Kratom, to the marketplace. Uh, we were able to successfully get that provision stripped out of the bill before it got to committee uh, in order for the, the legislation to have the kind of support that they wanted. Now, there still are a couple of sections in the report that, I, I'm sorry, in the legislation that are very concerning to us because we don't think that they have uh, fully, the committee fully examined what the uh, the downsides are and the unintended consequences of, that, of, of those provisions in the legislation are. For example, we were arguing most of the day today to members of the committee in individual meetings with them that if they were to allow for the enactment date to take place, which it typically does, in just a couple of days after or a month after the uh, the passage of the legislation, if they were to keep in place the requirements they have for putting uh, Kratom products behind the counter, uh, the labeling restrictions, you would have thousands of violators within that first month. It made no sense. And so they did agree, but they had to do it grudgingly in the committee to move the enactment date to January 1st of 2025, which gives time for this to happen. But the things they haven't addressed, and one of them was actually raised, and then the answer was improperly given, which was who are going to be the enforcement agencies to make sure that the Kratom Consumer Protection Act and its provisions are adhered to. And Representative Townsend said, oh, it'll be the local law enforcement officials. Now, this issue was raised last year and there was a, a clear expression by the, uh, the Georgia Sheriff's Association. They want no parts of this. They don't know what Kratom is. It is not a problem to them. And the objection that the Sheriff's Association representatives raised was, we wouldn't know how to go about regulating this product or enforcing it in any way. And yet, Representative Townsend said, oh, it'll be the local police departments and sheriffs that will do this. They don't know what a proper label is. They don't know what the level of metrogeny or 7-hydroxymetrogeny is or isn't. And they certainly wouldn't know whether the label complies. And they have no idea 
about how they could uh, in any way interpret any label or the, the actual levels of the uh, ingredients, what they would be. Now they could do the easy thing, which is to say, if they caught a clerk selling a, a Kratom product to a consumer and that consumer was under the age of 21, that's pretty affirmative uh, you know, allegation and, they, and the police could obviously enforce that, but none of the rest of it. So that makes no sense. Uh, the other part of the concern that we have is that in order to secure the supply chain of Kratom from a processor distributor to a retailer, the retailer wants to have some comfort that when they purchase the, the items that they want to sell in their stores from a distributor, that they're not gonna end up in court uh, every week defending themselves saying, I didn't violate this law. I did exercise good judgment. I didn't uh, you know, ignore the provisions along the way. But the way the law, the provision is currently written is contradictory. And so we've, uh, we've been assured that there'll be some work on the floor to correct this. Uh, we know that there are leaders in state government who have a better understanding of this issue. So we will continue to work on this as it goes through. Uh, the, the bottom line is that if we had to live with what's there now, uh, it's better than it was before. It's just not the optimum, but we're gonna continue to fight to protect that supply chain because you wanna have retailers confident that they're going to be able to sell Kratom products and not be drugged into court by trial lawyers every other week and pay money to defend themselves uh, for having done exactly what they have committed to do and that they are legally responsible for doing along the way. So Georgia is, is sort of the Petri dish for explaining why uh, legislation is difficult and why misimpressions can suddenly become facts without it being the, the truth. And that's the way the legislators work because they just don't understand Kratom and they don't know what it's about. I made the point to the chairman of the committee before he said that he didn't want me to testify because he thought we had done enough work prior to the committee hearing, <clears throat> which by the way, not the way legislative processes start to work. But he, uh, I made the point to him, I said the whole premise of the Georgia law was a year ago, <clears throat> excuse me, when it passed the house, was that the FDA had concluded that Kratom was dangerous. And I conceded that point to him that that was the FDA's position. And understandably, legislators might look to the FDA without understanding the background about Kratom and say the FDA's made this affirmative decision that Kratom is dangerous. I said the thing that changed between now and then is that the FDA, when called before a federal judge to testify under oath and to produce documents which would attest to the FDA's position being valid that Kratom is dangerous, they declined to do so. And I provided the court documents that showed that the FDA, in fact, refused to come to the court ordered hearing that was solely ordered for the purpose of determining whether Kratom was dangerous or not. And the FDA explained that they had not yet come to the determination that Kratom was dangerous. Now we know why, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but the, the, the legislature should, should certainly account for that because if the original premise was the FDA was right and now the FDA has backtracked, what are we gonna do? Now, why does the FDA take a different position today? Uh, it is because uh, they have now concluded their dose finding study, which they had announced in 2021. They had a few bumps along the way to actually get it done, but they've done it. Now, what that means is that the FDA has conducted a human clinical trial where they have taken humans and they have dosed them with different varying levels of kratom to determine whether or not there is an adverse event that gets associated with the consumption of kratom. These are human beings, not test animals. This is the gold standard for drug development. And they've applied it here to Kratom because the FDA has maintained for a long time, as we all know, that Kratom is dangerous. So what, what did the dose finding study reveal? The FDA has not yet disclosed the actual data, but in conversations with some of the principals in the study who were involved directly in the uh, evaluation of the actual study data, said that the FDA was profoundly disappointed in the results, meaning that they saw levels of Kratom consumption that were magnitudes higher than they hoped would occur before there was an adverse event. And by the way, the adverse event was nausea and vomiting. They didn't, they didn't go so far any higher than that. 
uh, because all they had to do is hit that point and the levels of kratom consumption to get to that point, which is a fairly minor adverse event, were magnitudes higher than the FDA thought they would be. I think that speaks to the, the baseline here that the FDA has been wrong for two decades about kratom and that they should follow the advice that uh, the Dr. Zhuwa gave them, which is to, to go through the steps that are necessary in order to demonstrate with scientific accuracy what the true character of Kratom's alkaloids are and what the health effects or the negative effects may be. So the next step for the FDA is to go through a human abuse potential study. That'll take anywhere from nine months to two years, uh, likely closer to the two years, because there they will actually dose humans with varying levels of Kratom over a long period of time in order to determine the point at which a person becomes addicted. Uh, or and, and then of course, the degree of that addiction, because we understand that there are benign addictions or dependencies for which there is little uh, problem with the person dealing with it. They can continue to function. They can, they can socialize with people, maintain uh, jobs. They can, they can in every way function as a normal person versus those that are dramatically impaired in their addiction because of the consumption of some substance, in this case, Kratom. We know that uh, depending on the, and there are a couple of things here. One is how much Kratom do you take in a day? How much Kratom do you take in a week? Uh, and, and depending on what your frequency is and whether or not you truly are addicted, which means that you either are physically dependent on it or you have a psychological dependence, this human clinical trial is designed to kind of dissect that and identify what those, those points are. Uh, we are confident that this is a great step forward because the FDA is now going to have to live with the results as they go forward, coupled with the fact that they have admitted that they have not yet come to this determination and that they are now proceeding with another human clinical trial on the dependency. Uh, that's a good thing. It will require after they've concluded this and assuming that they come out with the result that we think they will, which is that there is no substantial addiction liability, they will want to then go do extracts. And extracts are a whole different issue because you have to then do the, the, uh, the dose finding study. And then you would have to conduct another human abuse potential study, which again, over the next three to four years is probably what the FDA is going to try to do. Uh, but that's, that's the complexity of this issue. And it's difficult for state legislators to get their arms around that other than the basic bottom line talking points, which is the FDA by their own admission has not yet determined whether Kratom is dangerous or not. Uh, and we think that's a great step forward uh, going forward. So a uh, couple other states that I want to tell you about that, uh, that we're very active in and continuing to work. Let's start with, uh, uh, with the negative ones. Uh, the state of Nebraska, Senator Libicott filed a bill to ban Kratom. Uh, we had a hearing out there. Uh, Dr. Henningfield spoke. We had a great turnout of Kratom advocates from Nebraska. Thank you to those who did. Your voices are extremely important. Uh, we, we uh, I think, made great headway in that committee. Uh, I don't think that Senator Lippincott at this point has uh, sufficient uh, support in order to get it out of committee. And the only process to bypass the committee structure is for Senator Lippincott to use one of his privileges, and they are limited, so he can't use it willy-nilly, uh, to ask for a, uh, a, a re you know, removal from the bill from the committee, and it requires a substantial number of senators to do that. And I think that the evidence that we presented, the testimony that was provided, uh, speaks against uh, Kratom being, being banned, and I think that's why the committee itself is not inclined at this point to move it out. We were gonna watch this carefully, uh, we're going to monitor it, and we're going to make sure that we have our voices heard to defend against any effort uh, to move the bill out of the committee. And subsequently, if Senator Limicott tries, we'll try to defeat that uh, when he has a vote on the on the Senate floor. Uh, Nebraska is a unicameral legislature, unique in the United States. There are only a couple of states that have that. Uh, and so it makes it a little more complex to make sure we stop the bill because there's not two houses in order to do that kind of legislative um, uh, you know, hand-wringing and, and finagling, uh, but that's where we are there. It is my understanding that uh, the state of Maryland is probably going to have a banned bill filed by the end of the week, which is their deadline for filing of bills. We got advanced notice of this. We're gonna be participating 
in some conversations with the potential sponsors of those bill over the next couple of days. Uh, we'll report back to you. We will fight these. There has not been a ban that's been approved in the United States by any state since 2017, with Rhode Island being the last one uh, to do it. Of those states, the six states that did ban uh, uh, Kratom, we know that in the state of Vermont, initially we received a, an email from the health department saying that they had accepted uh, our petition that, we, that the American Kratom Association had filed with the health department uh, and, and concluded that it did not meet the criteria for scheduling. Uh, what didn't happen that was supposed to have happened was the commencement of rulemaking in order to go through the steps necessary under Vermont law to make that into a fact. And so uh, the individual that had originally been assigned to do this had left the health department and it got caught in limbo. Uh, it's now working its way through the system and we expect an affirmation of the previously articulated decision by the Department of Health in Vermont that they, uh, they the, the metrogenine and 7 hydroxy metrogenine will be removed from their controlled substances list. So that's one state, obviously, of the six that we're, that we're working on. In the state of Indiana, we are currently negotiating with, and it is a slog, with some people in the Senate Health Committee who believe that Kratom is dangerous, uh, and they've, they've stymied the bill that, uh, that was already passed by the House by a vote of 54 to 30, I believe. Uh, and so we're working hard to get that done. And hopefully we'll, we'll I think what will we'll, we'll spring that free is when we have success in two states, which I'll, I'll describe now. One is the state of Rhode Island. Uh, the, we have passed the Kratom Consumer Protection Act, which would repeal the ban in Rhode Island and then replace it with the KCPA. It has passed twice in the Rhode Island House of Representatives. What we lacked is a firmly committed Senate sponsor who had the clout to get it through. And we have uh, received a commitment from Senator, uh, a Senator who is the president pro tem of the, uh, of the Rhode Island Senate, has been in the Senate for a long period of time. She is highly respected, both by the leadership in the Senate and by her colleagues. And she has now committed to sponsor the KCPA in the Rhode Island State Senate. And this is, uh, I think, a great uh, a milestone for us to cross. Uh, and so I'm confident that this year will be, as Speaker Joe Shikarchi uh, has said, it is the year of Kratom in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, we are having uh, a similar success in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the, the Controlled Substances Board in the state of Wisconsin had previously, over the past year, studied Kratom, and they affirmed that Kratom should not, did not meet the criteria for scheduling under Wisconsin law. But they did say that Kratom shouldn't be just legalized without regulation. Of course, that's what the KCPA does. Uh, the Sheriff's Association in the state of Wisconsin has, and I think de deliberately so, misstated what the conclusion of the Controlled Substances Board is. And so to clear up that confusion, we have agreed that a provision will be put into the KCPA that will allow for the Controlled Substances Board to raise any objection that they would, they would like to make about the scheduling of Kratom, at which point the bill would become null. We give them six months to do that. Uh, we, are, we are confident that the previous rigorous review that they did last year will bear out with this, and particularly with the recent admissions of the FDA in terms of their not being able to, uh, to, to define Kratom as being dangerous. Uh, we think that that'll help us in the state of Wisconsin as well. So again, we're, we're very hopeful there that that will move forward. In the state of Arkansas, the Arkansas legislature is not in session this year, but in, in the session last year, they passed out unanimously uh, a vote to allow the, the Joint Senate and House Health Committee to review the KCPA to rescind the current ban. Uh, and that hearing is going to take place sometime between April and September, and it will be a very extensive hearing. I would suggest that there'll be more time spent in that hearing than the Department of Health spent in considering the recommendation for scheduling initially, which was done by one doctor. Uh, the announcement of the uh, hearing on, or the opening of the hearing on the ban or the public comment on the proposed ban came on at nine in the morning or 10 in the, in the morning and closed at five. There was no public input on this. And of course, we're gonna reverse that 
And I think that that will set the stage for uh, the KCPA to pass and the repeal there, uh, repeal the ban there in the state of Arkansas. Uh, Alabama, we're working with some potential uh, lobbyists who are influential uh, in the state, and hopefully they can break the barrier there. It is a tough state. Uh, there are confusing issues, both with medical marijuana that we have to contend with as competing issues in this space, and tianeptine, uh, which has become a, a flashpoint for uh, legislators in Alabama who unfortunately equate tianeptine with kratom. It shouldn't be. They are different products. They are formulated differently, and they have different effects. And so uh, we're hoping to educate legislators there. Uh, it's going to take a little time, and that's where we are. So uh, that's a recap of the, the states where we have either bans or we're trying to remove bans. We're actively working, as we are in Georgia, uh, to refine the KCPA and strengthen it. We're doing the same thing in the state of, of Florida, working hard there. Uh, lots of disinformation that's being circulated in Florida. We're fighting against it, and we're doing our best in order to bring that one uh, across the finish line as well. The current law will be the law no matter what, which is that you can't buy Kratom under the age of 21, but we would like to see strengthening regulations there to make sure that there are not unsafe products that are on the marketplace in the state of Florida. Uh, other states that we are currently working on in order to pass the KCPA include the state of Kansas. Uh, we are working hard in Michigan, in Minnesota, uh, in Illinois. In Illinois, it came out of the Rules Committee, uh, and so it's now actively being considered. We're active in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in North Carolina, and South Carolina, New Jersey, New York, uh, and I believe, uh, I know I've missed one or two, uh, but we're, we've got a lot of these states where we're at, oh, in Massachusetts, uh, we're doing great uh, in getting edu the legislators educated, and, and they're seeing the progress that we're having with the KCP, KCPAs around the country. So uh, very exciting stuff. And we're working hard on all of these things in order to make sure that we have a well-regulated marketplace that preserves the consumer's safety as the critical factor in, uh, in making sure that we are, uh, we're getting good products in the marketplace that are well that are labeled properly and that are protective of people. Uh, I think that um, that one of the, the the complexities of what we're doing is that the sad events make our case. Uh, we know the case of Shana Brown in in Alabama is tragic. Uh, we know that there are arrests that have taken place in Indiana and in Wisconsin uh, and in Arkansas have similarly uh, difficult problems, and so. Uh, you know, we've just got to fight past this. This idea of prohibition, this idea of putting people in jail for the use of a plant that is not a controlled substance under federal law has no scientific basis to be characterized as a controlled substance in any state that was a policy decision that was influenced by disinformation from the FDA. We've got to fix that. And that, of course, is our crusade as we go forward. Uh, and I'm grateful for all of the people that show up uh, regularly at these hearings when you're able to do so. And I understand, by the way, that there's some disappointment sometimes we say, oh, well, we didn't get very many uh, advocates at the hearings. Literally, these, these hearings are, are called within a day. Uh, and often, you don't even know that the bills are up until that afternoon. That, that was true in Georgia here today. Our lobbyists knew, but it was not publicly disclosed. In Nebraska, we had very short period of time uh, to know about it. It is true in most states because of the legislative process that you don't get much notice, and that accounts for why the public input may not be as robust as we would often like. But your email messages, your social media postings all make a difference, and we're, we're most grateful to everyone who helps to organize those, to, to stir the pot, to stimulate them. Those are very important things as we go forward. Uh, there are some other states that we would like to be able to be active in, we're waiting to see some things that play out. An example is in the state of Tennessee. Uh, when we passed the KCPA out of the House into the Senate, the Senate chairman of the Judiciary Committee stopped us. Uh, he continues to be a problem. We're working with him to try to resolve uh, those issues. And so in that, in that sense, we're doing our best to try to make sure that these legislators 
understand the true uh, character of the kratom plant and its products that are made from it, uh, that, that there needs to be limitations on the forms of some products. The labeling has to be clear that we have to know what serving sizes there are, how many servings in a container and warnings, appropriate warnings about how much you should take in a day, whether there are conflicting uh, medical issues you might have. You should consult a doctor. You can't, the label can't include any therapeutic claims. Those are all important things to build the credibility of the Kratom marketplace, but more importantly, to protect consumers, to allow consumers to be informed about the products that they're using. So uh, that's a recap uh, on the states that we're working in right now. Uh, at the federal level, uh, we're working right now to educate federal legislators. And then hopefully when we've completed with sufficient amount of time to complete that, uh, to get start gathering those co-signers as co-sponsors onto the bill. And that will then lead to a, a hearing, which we hope will take place this year. This is an election year, very, very few legislative days that we can play with, but we want to get to a vote next year on the Kratom Consumer, the Federal Kratom Consumer Protection Act. And you have champions, and I mean true champions like Mike Lee from the state of Utah, Cory Booker from New Jersey. And then you have our good friend Jack Bergman from Michigan, who we're going to talk about in a minute, who's going to be putting on a presentation uh, out in Las Vegas here on the 14th, uh, on the 16th, I'm sorry. And then you have uh, uh, Mark Pocan from Wisconsin, who has been from day one a champion for consumers to have access to safe, unadulterated Kratom products. These people deserve all of our praise because they've stepped out and they've made it clear. And in the case of, of, of Representative Bergman, it's an interesting story. Former Lieutenant General in the Marine Corps, he is a believer in helping veterans to have access to therapies that can help them with PTSD, can help them with service-related injuries and the associated issues with the therapies that they are being prescribed and how Kratom can be one of the things, including psilocybin and other things that can help these veterans who are really our heroes uh, to be able to be protected. And, and it's gonna be a great session that we have on the 16th that he's gonna lead. And hopefully we'll get a lot of focus on this aspect of it where Kratom is helping people. And when I, when I spoke to um, the NIDA director, Nora Volko, and I, I made the point of complimenting her on her commitment to Kratom research and reference the 30 plus million dollars that has been expended by NIDA that's in, in, in funding studies and in the pipeline, she corrected me. And she said, actually, Mac, it's closer to 100 million and because we're committed to this. And then she disclosed that she personally, in her lab that she has at NIDA, is doing Kratom research. And she started to explain what she's interested in. Uh, and it all goes down to harm reduction. It all goes down to the value this plant has. Now, obviously there are critics and we understand that there are oftentimes going to be concerns about Kratom products. There, and I'll just make this point. There are products on the marketplace right now that are labeled as Kratom products. And you can see from the packaging, you can see from the description of the products that they are they have kratom in them, but it's a minor part of the product, and that they have other things in them that are highly uh, dangerous potentially, and that are suspect in terms of, of people being able to safely consume them. And so it is unfair, and it highlights the point. And I made this to a, a Georgia legislator today: if you if you don't carefully define what a kratom product is in the legislation, and if you don't provide a, an appropriate mechanism for there to be an identification through an independent third-party test, you won't know what's in that Kratom product. You've got to have that provision in there. And the trial attorneys don't care about that. They care about getting to court and, and they hope that the product is bad because that gives them more uh, advantage in terms of making an argument for how uh, this Kratom product might harm people. It truly should be a Kratom product, not something that is labeled as a Kratom product. And of course, we know what bans do they create a black market. And in a black market, adulterated Kratom products flourish. And so that's something that we have to obviously be aware of. We need to fight against it. We need to make sure that our standards are about protecting people um, in, in actually doing the things, being able to consume products in doing things that help them to improve their health and well-being with informed 
uh, an informed basis to do so. So that's uh, what we're ultimately uh, trying to do here. And with all the work that we're doing that we've been successful so far, uh, I think we're gonna continue to, to go uh, full speed ahead and we're gonna be working with uh, with even our detractors. You know, I, I had an interesting conversation with a woman who called me a couple of days ago who represented that she is a member of the Kratom Danger Awareness Group. And she was uh, critical of the fact that I, I am unwilling to have a dialogue. And I informed her, I said, that's, that's a little surprising to me because I have tried to join the KDA and was rebuffed for doing so, mocked for doing so. Um, I have openly invited the KDA, any of their members or leaders, to come on a, a Zoom call and have a conversation. Uh, and that's been re rebuffed. So there, there's this mythology out there that says, oh, well, we're, we're in some war with the KDA and we're the ones who are unwilling to have the discussion. And that's simply untrue. Uh, the KDA, and it's a standing offer, anytime they want to have an open public discussion, I'm for it. And we can come to the, 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 the discussion at the table and discuss things. They can be uncomfortable. I don't mind that. They can be a full-throated criticism of Kratom and what it does. We can talk about those things. Uh, and here's what happens. Invariably, you will hear, and, and I've seen it, uh, that the criticisms the KDA offers, and they're without any integrity, in my opinion, when they say things like, oh, well, the KDA funds all of these scientific studies that are pro-Kratom. Now, there is one study that the uh, American Kratom Association in, in, in conjunction with other nonprofits helped to fund one study. And that was the, uh, the rat study that looked at the levels at which Kratom might be dangerous in terms of consumption using the FDA's protocol for, it's called the oxycodone protocol, for which they recommend that any substance to test its safety should follow. Prior to the initiation of that study, the scientists that did it told me, okay, it's fine that you've helped to fund this study. We will not allow you, the conditions they put on it to accept the money was that we will not allow you to be a part of the design of the protocol. We will not permit you to know anything about the study nor to receive the results of it until we've completed it and that we have submitted and briefed the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. Now, I don't know many people that are willing to put them, their money at risk to do that, except we did, because we believe that science should dictate it, good or bad, should dictate what comes out of, and the results of that kind of, of research. But the KDA says, oh, the FDA, the, uh, the AKA funds all of these studies, and they throw the blanket out, and they're talking about the 100 plus studies funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. We don't fund those, we funded one. And by the way, that study showed without any input from us, without any, uh, any involvement in any way until the, the publication of the data after they had met with, uh, with the uh, FDA and NIDA people, uh, they found that at incredibly high doses, as much as the metrogenine as could be put into an aqueous solution, meaning as much as you can inject into a test animal, 400 times, the amount that any human could could uh, reasonably uh, actually take, there were no deaths. And of course, the oxycodone animals, they exactly what they expected with deaths because that's what the study's designed to test. And so if the substance being tested against oxycodone is comparably more safe, but this went beyond the pale. It went to 400 times the amount that a human could consume and still there were no deaths in the test animals. There was sedation, which we expect, and obviously is a byproduct of that high level of kratom being consumed. My point is that the, the research, the scientific studies that are ongoing right now, true science, are actually showing that kratom can be safely and responsibly consumed if it's properly manufactured and labeled. And that's what we hope to get to. Uh, so the other things that the KDA says, and it's unfortunate, uh, they, they throw shots across the bow, they call names, uh, they they ask questions that I think are interesting, but not very serious. For example, they'll say, oh, does Mac recommend that Kratom be taken by his grandchildren? Now, this is a ridiculous question to ask, because the truth is that 
we already support an age 18 and under, and in some states we're in 21, but that's a preference of the legislature. The question is, would I recommend that my child under the age of 18 take Kratom without my supervision or my grandchild doing the same? And the answer to that is no. That's the reason we advocate for it, because we think that this should be an informed decision. And I think anyone under the age of 18 really needs to have the help of either their parents or a medical professional before they use any substance, including Kratom, to manage what uh, otherwise might be a difficult problem that they're having with other substances. So, you know, the, the, but the fundamental question is, do I think it's unsafe? No. And then they'll say, oh, well, Mac, what, how much Kratom do you use? I use it a lot. Uh, I think that uh, that it is a an issue, and I'm not saying that because I endorse it, it makes it any better. I got interested in using Kratom because of age-related pain issues, and I have a bad knee, which ultimately is going to have to be replaced, and a bad hip. So I use it regularly. I haven't had any side effects of it, uh, although some could argue that I seem a little bit uh, disoriented. Uh, I don't think I do. Uh, that's just the kind of thing that we have to have a reasonable, fair discussion about and not throw them out as these zingers. Uh, and that's unfortunately what happens. And I'll say this again, I've said it before, whenever we find that kind of name calling, some of it's vicious that I'm the, the, the son of Satan and Hitler, that goes beyond the pale. When we see that kind of thing on any social media platform that we control and manage, we remove it because that is hate speech in my opinion. It is inappropriate. It's not part of a civil discussion. And the KDA people can talk all they want. They are extremists. The leadership of the KDA are extremists. And I'll call them out any day when they will not, they will not have, engage in a civil discussion and facilitate these kinds of, of terrible statements made by people that they not only support, but they give them a platform to do so. Uh, I hope that changes. Uh, we certainly offer the opportunity to them to do it at, whenever we can. So uh, that's, I think that, that part of our discussion as we go forward ought to be to look at the reality. You either have on one hand, the, the, uh, the wild west with a completely unregulated marketplace, which is where the FDA is today, or you have a ban, and the ban serves to create what Dr. Zhuwa accurately portrayed two events. One is that you will force people who are today using Kratom to manage acute and chronic pain back on to far more dangerous and potentially deadly products to do the same thing. And none of us want that. The second thing that will be created with a ban is what inevitably happens, you have a black market created. And the black market is anything but regulated. It's illegal on its face. These pro They'll throw out products, whatever they can, and, and market them as being completely safe, and they'll be adulterated with horrible things. And so uh, this, this is, we should learn. We should learn from our mistakes in the past with this kind of attitude, and we ought to look at reasonable ways to do it. So if our friends at the KDA truly want to protect the American public, we should do, through, do so with good regulations that will limit the exposure uh, of people to products that are unsafe, highly addictive, and adulterated, and that we should make sure that people are properly informed through good labeling about what the, uh, what the circumstances of their use ought to be and what the recommendations are. So I, I think that, uh, that that's something that I hope they'll listen to. I hope that they'll reach out and we're certainly willing to do it as we go forward. Uh, I know that, uh, that there's always the concern when, and I hear it from legislators and I hear it more often from news people. They say, oh, well, you know, they say that Kratom is killing people. I will say this again. Uh, if anyone is willing to provide, and I said this to the Tampa Bay Times, by the way, for the 48 deaths I think they had, or maybe it was 46, whatever it was, deaths that they claim were Kratom only. I said, you get the blood samples, you select the independent lab, we'll pay for it, and let's have them tested. Because we see consistently what the Centers for Disease Control Review found and what the uh, the Colorado uh, health officials found, as reported in the Journal of American Medical Association, that when proper and rigorous testing is applied to those blood samples, because the medical examiner's coroners didn't have the money to order a full drug screen, they found polydrug use in every case. And, the, and none, none that had um, metrogenine level that was in any way responsible for death that they've been able to verify. 
Uh, even the largest uh, toxicology firm in the country, NMS Labs, published from their scientists a peer-reviewed published article that said the level of concern for Kratom is 1,000 nanograms per milliliter in the bloodstream of someone who is deceased. Uh, the case in Florida, which we're helping on, uh, showed that the uh, that the the actual levels of metrogenine in that decedent's bloodstream was 350, I think, or right in that range, nanograms per milliliter. A third of what the uh, NMS labs say is even a level of concern, and yet the the medical the coroner in that case called it the metrogenine death. That's why we're challenging it. We want these accurate reports. So if anyone has an autopsy uh, or a tox screen that we want to look at and has the, the, the available evidence, we'll do that because we're just as anxious to find if there is a level, what that is going forward. So uh, that's, I, I extend that invitation. I'll do it again. I'll continue to do it because ultimately they're gonna break down and have to do something in order to justify what I openly characterize as a very extreme position uh, where they want to, you know, fire shots and they don't want to act responsibly. So hopefully they'll come around on that. Uh, that said, uh, I'll, I'll conclude there, uh, Ryan, we can turn it back for questions that anyone might have. And uh, I'll just say thank you again to everybody for joining us tonight, for being a part of the discussion as we go forward here. Thank you very much, Mac. And uh, do you have any idea what will happen to a person convicted of having Kratom in Arkansas if the legislature eventually decides it should not have been scheduled as a class one felony? Would that person be exonerated from what was previously considered a crime? So I'm not a lawyer, so I can't answer this question with, that, uh, with a definitive legal opinion. But I can tell you that if the Arkansas legislature uh, passes the repeal of the ban. It is no longer a controlled substance. It therefore would have no criminal charge associated with it. So the past convictions, the uh, their attorneys could move to remove the convictions because the basis upon which it was a controlled substance had been determined by the legislature to be invalid. And I think that would be a great appeal case to take. Thank you. <laughs> From Abdullah, uh, what age requirements should we follow in California? Well, I tell legislators every legislators every day that 18 is the right spot. And the reason I say that is really derivative of multiple conversations I've had with legislators, uh, I'm sorry, with scientists. And Dr. Jack Henningfield answered this question in Louisiana when some one legislator, state senator asked him, well, don't you think it's bad that 18-year-olds can go to a gas station and buy Kratom. And Dr. Henningfield said, I think it's wonderful. It's needed because if you're struggling, and by the way, kids that are 18 are struggling with these drug addictions, you need to have accessibility. And when you look at the studies that are being done, there's one recently, just a couple of weeks ago that was done that showed if you want to get into a treatment facility for a substance disorder, there the beds aren't there. So you're only lucky. And then it's financial accessibility because they are so expensive. So you leave a large portion, a significant portion of the people that are struggling with these addictions out of reach of the help that they need. And Dr. Henningfield's point, and I completely agree with it, is you need, you need to look at, at what the, the actual accessibility for treatments will be. If you're in a rural area or if you're in an urban area, it doesn't matter if you can't get into a bed or if you cannot uh, for a treatment program or afford it. You need to have other options. And when you look at the great data and evidence that's been provided uh, by Johns Hopkins University and by NIDA studies, it's a valuable harm reduction tool that ought to be accessible to people. So yes, 18. Now, if a legislature decides in their wisdom they want to make it 21, we have to live with that. Not our preference, but we'll go along with it. Great. Thank you. And uh, how are things looking for Kratom in California? So uh, California, huge state, uh, obviously more complex than most states to deal with. Uh, because of the nature of the legislative process there, it is extremely expensive uh, to, to hire lobbyists to, to embark on what is a, at least a two-year process, sometimes longer, in the state of California. So uh, we've been, we made the, the strategic decision up until now to allocate limited resources and, and send them uh, to other states. And our thinking was that California could then see what other states are doing. 
I think we've reached that point, and I believe that we've, we're fingers crossed, we're going to have a lobbying team ready to go in the state of California, and hopefully we'll get a bill passed or uh, filed there that can start that process. Uh, you touched on this earlier, but just a brief uh, Illinois KCPA and standing. We're we're looking at we're working with the uh, the Senate Chairman of the Health Committee. It's uh, been a little bit of a, a grind. I think the recent developments with the FDA are going to help us. So we're waiting to see if he's willing to have a more robust discussion about it. Otherwise, he stymied us. We're going to keep trying though. And. How much research has been done on the mental health benefits? I use it for obsessional thoughts and compulsive behavior and depression. So a large part of the uh, research that's being done, by, funded by NIDA, addresses a couple of important issues. One is what are the potential benefits that Kratom can offer? And a part of that is, of course, the sector of the brain that deals with anxiety and mood disorders. And I think that's essentially what you're speaking to. The, in order to get down to a specific indication uh, for, let's say, for compulsive behavior, as you referenced, uh, that would require a, a new drug application uh, to be filed with human clinical trial work. Uh, that may happen in the future because as we identify specific diseases that need to have therapies, there's a market then that gets associated with that, and that leads to some investigation probably is a rare uh, disorder, excuse me, rare disorder, but I think it, it could happen, but it's a more detailed analysis. The general uh, research that's ongoing right now, the scientific research is really determining whether the safety factor of people at the levels at which they are consuming Kratom delivers a beneficial impact. And certainly that's been proven so far with uh, the anecdotal data and the survey research data. Now I think they're gonna have to drill down a little further. Thank you. And uh, what is the KCPA's position on enhanced kratom powders, i.e. kratom powder to which a small amount of extract has been added? The kratom product that has helped me the most for pain relief is such a product. So there, there are two broad, you know, kratom formulation of products. You have, you have um, natural leaf products, and then you have extract products. Natural leaf products can uh, be extracted as well. I mean, it's not just a division between uh, liquid drinks, which many people think are the extracts. Well, no, you can have pure leaf powder in a liquid drink, uh, just as you can uh, if for an extract, but you can also have extract powders. So if you mix, and I, if I understand the question correctly, kratom powder, and then you mix it with an extracted kratom product. The reason that manufacturers extract the kratom is that they want to re remove all of the potential contaminants and they isolate down to metrogeny and they then dose it at, at with specific recommendations for the amount that you should take in a serving size. I think that's great. And I think that's a safe product formulation if it's extracted properly using FDA approved methodologies for doing it. Uh, we are in the Kratom marketplace today, in my view, a rat race to develop more potent products, more powerful experiences and I think that could be the uh, the end of the Kratom industry unless we step in and more responsibly uh, regulate ourselves in the industry. And that includes consumers. Consumers shouldn't be buying this stuff that obviously is designed to give you a euphoric high that the natural plant or an extraction of the natural plant without elevating the alkaloid content or its its power uh, should should be delivered to you. So I think we we're in our GV, GMP 4.0 program, uh, which we'll announce here shortly, is going to address that directly. Our labeling guidelines are going to address that directly. Uh, we can't let the quest for finding you know, a, a more powerful experience do us all in. And that potentially could happen if we're not responsible about it. So we've been advocating for, uh, for, for the manufacturers to be more diligent in this area. And I think we're having some effect. Oh, I know we are. But I can tell you that one of the problems with extracts is that the in a liquid form, they're easier to take and they become more bioavailable more quickly, which means they hit you quicker. If you take a powder product, all of you know that it might take 15 to 20 minutes before you feel the full effects of a kratom serving size. But if you drink a product in liquid form, it's the, the body absorbs it much more quickly and the effects hit you faster. So there's got to be 
responsible labeling of those extract products. And, uh, and I think that's the key to it, not to ban them, uh, but to properly regulate them. And I think that's where we're headed. Thank you. And what position, if any, does the pharmaceutical companies have with the availability of Kratom? Well, we've heard lots of the anecdotal evidence that the uh, pharma companies aren't big fans uh, of Kratom because of their potential competition with existing products that deal with acute and chronic pain. That's understandable. It's the marketplace. Uh, they would prefer all of that uh, be done as new drug applications. So you would have to go through the human clinical trials, but it's not patentable at the end. That's the problem. So why would anyone invest in a new drug application process that requires you to spend several billion dollars and take five to 10 years? And then at the end of the day, you have no market exclusivity because you cannot patent the compound, which in this case is a naturally occurring alkaloid in a plant. That said, there are ways that they can modify the molecules in the alkaloids in the kratom plant, and they can produce chemically a synthesized version of it. And that's fair game for any uh, kratom pharmaceutical uh, endeavor to take place. And I think that we all know that there's at least one that's in that process. Uh, it was Dr. Andrew Krugel who was one of the pioneers in kratom research at Columbia University that now has a company that's uh, on the pathway to do exactly that. But it's a modified molecule of the Kratom plant that would make it truly in the classification of a new drug. And, uh, and that, of course, is something that may eventually happen in the marketplace. And God love them that they do it because uh, we find that most of the, or a significant portion of the uh, pharmaceutical products we have today started as plant-based medicines that were then taken and reformulated in order to, because of their effects, in order to make them into prescription drugs. And how does the AKA feel about extracts that are made in a kitchen versus a clean room? So there's an old adage, let the consumer beware. There are too many risks and too many problems with doing extraction in your kitchen or your garage or your basement or anywhere outside of the clean room. Uh, this is a highly dangerous process because it takes controlled, highly sensitive protocols in order to properly and safely manufacture any extracted product. Uh, and so I, I think that you are, you are far better off by magnitudes of buying your Kratom products from, uh, that are processed and manufactured in a clean room, which protects the level of safety uh, far better and superior to, and everyone should just forget about buying uh, extract products made in the kitchen. And presently, are consumers able to buy American-grown Kratom? Sure, but it, there's not enough at the time, right now, enough production to match need. So we know that there are uh, plantations in Florida, uh, uh, one of which I'm sure is a, uh, is a, uh, a commercially viable venture. Uh, in, in Hawaii, there is a significant effort to create a Kratom industry that will be very significant. Uh, and so uh, you'll see more of that. I visited the farm uh, by, by the description of the farmers there. They have, uh, they have tested the alkaloid content of Hawaiian grown Kratom uh, and looked at it by comparison to Indonesian grown Kratom and they match or exceed the metrogeny levels, which is interesting. Now, the reason that they did is they carefully cloned the plant they did, they did, you know, I guess there's all kinds of ways in plant genetics that you can do things. They did it in a way that maximizes the output of successfully, at least of matching those plants. So I, I see there's a healthy industry that eventually will develop in the United States. Uh, it's just not there yet, but as you, all of us know, anybody who's been to Hawaii, uh, two things are true. The climate's great. It matches what you need uh, for growing a kratom. And secondly, there is a need in Hawaii to replace the pineapple industry and the sugarcane industry, which have been devastated on world markets, and that's part of competition for products. Uh, this might be the economic boon that Hawaii is looking for. Okay, and our final question here, what is the AKA stance on kava and mixing it with kratom? So this is a tricky question. Uh, there are products on the marketplace now that mix uh, kratom with a number of things, CBD, uh, the, the, the kava, uh, and obviously, when you go to kava bars who have added kratom products, 
to their menus, it's it's obvious people could just mix them together on their own. They could take a half a kava drink and half a kratom drink. Uh, that's probably not the best way to do it. Uh, there ought to be some thought put into uh, the product. My bottom line is that any mixture of a kratom product with a demonstrably a negative safety record should not take place. Uh, I don't think that the the kava is included in that category. I know there are critics of kava, just as there are critics of kratom. I don't think that the science proves that kava is in any way a uh, you know a, a dangerous substance. Now, there is a question about what happens if you mix kava and kratom. Is there some adverse event that's going to occur? And there are two ways you prove that. Obviously, with uh, with rigorous scientific studies, uh, which with natural products really isn't going to be realistic at this point. But then you look at what adverse events are associated with the consumption of a mixed kava and kratom drink or product. And if we don't see any, then that's a good experience data uh, database to follow uh, going forward. So my view is that the jury's still out. Uh, but I think that based on the market experience that people have had, that you would have, uh, unless you have a personal uh, aversion to it or an allergy to something that's in the kava plant, then I don't think it's a big problem. Yeah, well, thank you, Mac. And thank you all for joining us tonight. And Mac, I'll let you have the closing comments. Well, just to talk about uh, the February 16th event, Congressman Bergman is going to be making a presentation in Las Vegas at four o'clock at the Las Vegas Convention Center, talking about Kratom, its benefits uh, with uh, veterans and first responders. And it's gonna be a fabulous presentation if you are in the area or want to come to Las Vegas and think it's a great chance to have a couple of days of vacation, do it and come to this event because it will be uh, illuminating. It will be a milestone for us to go across where we're, we're again discussing uh, the importance of Kratom and how it can be effective uh, for people that are in those situations. We know from numerous testimonials of veterans that Kratom has either improved the quality of their life or saved their lives. And we think that's uh, that's important. And so please come to it. Uh, Congressman Bergman is a great champion. Uh, and I think that it, he'd love to see all of you if you're able to come uh, to that event. So we welcome at four o'clock on uh, Friday, February 16th at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Watch for Facebook notices about it. Uh, we'd love to have as many people are, are able to come. This will be a positive event. We're not coming to try to beat back a ban by the, the Nevada Board of Pharmacy. This is gonna be about stepping forward with a positive message to tell our story as we go forward. So I'd say that. And then I'd say thank you to all of you who have participated in making nominations to our, um, our Hall of Fame Kratom advocates. And the first group of those advocates will be legacy uh, Hall of Fame members defined as those who back in 2016 took the initial courageous step to step forward and be true leaders in protecting Kratom from being banned by the uh, by the DEA and by the FDA. Uh, and so we're, we're now having reviews, uh, a review team looking at those. Uh, we'll, we'll nominate those people and name them uh, there are going to be inevitably some that will probably uh, disappoint uh, some of the nominees, but the next step is to have our Hall of Fame, and we're going to do that twice a year, uh, and so we, we're seeking to recognize those true champions along the way. So if you're excluded or dropped from the first round, that doesn't mean you're done and out. You're not. Uh, it just means that we're looking at trying to, uh, based on the, the information we have available, exactly what happened there. This is going to be a great uh, program uh, to recognize these true champions in our industry. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, and then uh, just the final uh, advertisement. When you have the opportunity to speak up and speak out, please do it. Uh, we, we desperately need voices. We know that there's going to be an action in a negative one, as we had Nebraska in Maryland, because they're going to propose a ban. We need advocates to step up and, and actually tell their stories. And then in every legislature where you're able to do it, participate in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, all of the states that we're actually working in now, we need you to do it. We know that it can uh, be overwhelming sometimes, uh, but I can tell you it makes a difference. And, and you know, this is the crazy season for me. I'm sitting here in Georgia uh, tonight, having participated in the hearing, 
And, and I can't tell you what, where I'll be on Friday because it could be that quick that we've got another hearing that's scheduled. So, uh, and I know next week is crazy. So this is one of those things that I'm hoping that advocates will set aside some of the, hey, we do great, we don't need me, we need you. And so we ask everyone to, uh, to buckle up and, and hopefully uh, a little more sacrifice in order to make sure we get our message across. And it's our message, the one that we believe in, that we know it's not the naysayers and it's not the hyperbole that the people that follow the FDA uh, as though they're telling the gospel truth, which they are not uh, as we move forward here. So uh, thanks to everyone. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mac. And thank you all for a great evening. And we'll be in touch soon. Thank you.